Welcome to our second webinar, Basel Convention Amendment. Um, I'm Sal Michelli, I'm the program manager with East Stewards, and we'll introduce Jim. And we'll start off with the East Stewards announcements. We'll then go over to Basel Convention Basics by Jim, and then the Basel Ban Amendment, and then take your questions. We will also talk about the new plastics amendment and then take questions on that. All right. <clears throat> so Salome is going to tell you a few things about the East Stewards program. So for you to let you know, we are currently working on version four of the East Stewards standards. And this standard will go for a second review period, which this time will be public, so open to everyone whether Easter is certified or not. And that will open on January 6th and be open for 21 days. We look forward to get your comments on the standard and um, hear what you think about the new changes. Then also we have uh, an early bird special currently still open until January 26th. It offers you a 30% off your first year licensing fee. And the way it works, you make a, an earnest payment of 30% of your discounted first year licensing fee and then have until March 10th to decide whether you want to go with that or not or whether you want a full refund. So we plan to publish our new standard on February 26th. So that should give you a couple of days or about two weeks to um, to decide whether you want to go with the early bird special, which is um, which should help you um, to get on your way to become ESER certified. So you have until January 26 to sign up for that discount. The third announcement we'd like to make is currently the applications for the Advanced Plus program are open. This is a new eSearch program focused on providing jobs for people with autism or other disabilities. And we received funding which uh, reduces the training costs a lot. Um, usually trainings offered by the James Emmett company are um, priced at $3,500 um, $3, and we're going to offer it, sorry, $35,000 and we're going to offer it at $2,000. So if you want to make, uh, if you want to use that um, program, you should apply until December 15th. This is really a great way for uh, you to reduce your costs operating in a uh, recycling facility. So with no further ado, I'll hand <coughs> over to Jim. Jim is the founder and executive director of the Basel Action Network. He has been with the Basel Convention since its beginning and is a is one of the world's experts on the Basel Convention. So without further ado, I hand over to Jim. <laughs> All right, thank you, Salome. <clears throat> and uh, we thought we would do this second uh, webinar in our series. We're gonna try to do them every quarter. Uh, on the Basel Convention um, amendments. And the reason being things are changed a lot this year. Uh, a lot of times these treaties just go on and on and not a whole lot changes, but this year has been pretty um, eventful. And in fact, last week we had uh, a major change. So we're gonna be talking about that, but before I do that, I wanna get into just describing real quickly for people what the Basel Convention does. So it is called the Basel Convention on the Control of Transboundary Movements of Hazardous Waste and Their Disposal. Um, we'll talk about the history of it when I talk about the history of the ban amendment because it's really the same history. Um, but ban has been involved as a watchdog in the Basel Convention since 1997, and I personally have been involved since 1989 when it was first adopted in uh, Basel, Switzerland. So what does the Basel Convention do? Um, you can really break it down into the soft law, which are general obligations, and then the hard law. So the soft law, which is important, but you're not going to have anybody get arrested for not following it. These are general obligations. It calls for national self-sufficiency in waste management. So countries should take care of their own waste. Calls for minimizing all forms of transboundary movement of hazardous and other wastes. So um, 
that's extremely important. And it calls for minimizing the generation of hazardous and other wastes. I'll talk a little bit about what other waste means because it's actually a term of art. It's actually defined. Um, and then very important, it calls for ensuring environmentally sound management for that waste which is produced. So in the hard law aspect, most importantly, it defines hazardous waste and other waste. And it defines hazardous waste in two ways. First, according to the annexes. So Annex 1 is a list of constituents. Annex 3 is a list of hazardous characteristics. And Annex 8 is a list of waste streams which possess the characteristics and are listed as constituents. So it's a good estimate in Annex 8 of everything that is called for being hazardous with Annexes 1 and 3. The second way that hazardous waste is defined is by national law. So if any of the countries, the exporter, the importing country, or the transit country believes something to be a hazardous waste under national law, then it is a hazardous waste under international law in the Basel Convention when the trade takes place between a country that has such a national law. And then other waste is Annex 2, and it's known as waste for special consideration. And uh, there have been, until really recently, only two wastes listed there. Waste collected from households, so they're not necessarily considered hazardous, but they are controlled. And then incinerator ashes from incinerating household waste. It's the second one. And very recently this year, new listing uh, about plastic waste. And I'm going to talk about that as the second uh, big changes at Basel. So basically, the other part of the hard law is not just defining what is waste, but requiring controls. So what are those types of controls? The default control is a notification and consent mechanism. It's, it's often referred to as prior informed consent, or PIC, P-I-C. And that's spelled out in Article 6, exactly what you have to do if you're going to export a hazardous or in other waste, normally you have to be involved in prior informed consent. Without that being followed, it's illegal traffic. And illegal traffic is considered a criminal act. And apart from the default, which is the PIC procedure, there are certain prohibitions and bans. And uh, one of those just came into force last week. And of course, we'll be talking about the Basel ban amendment. But there are other bans. Countries are allowed to ban imports on a national basis. And they have to report that to the Secretariat of the Convention, and those are then listed in the country reports. And there's also a ban um, on the export of any of these wastes, hazardous and other, to Antarctica. Uh, there's a ban between parties and non-parties. There is an exception to that if you have an Article 11 agreement which is consistent with the Convention then you can trade with non-parties. But this is important because the U.S. is, as we'll learn, a non-party. They're not part of the Basel Convention. And so there is a de facto ban between other countries that are part of the Basel Convention trading with the U.S., unless they're part of an Article 11 agreement like the OECD agreement. Then finally, there's this new ban, which I just mentioned, which has been around for a long time, but is now finally in legal force as of December 5th. Now, when we look at the global picture, uh, it's stunning that the Basel Convention is very well saturated. There are 193 UN member states, so 193 countries in the world, and 186 of them are Basel parties. So just six are left out, and that's East Timor, Grenada, Haiti, San Marino, South Sudan, Tuvalu, and the USA. That's the company that we're in. Now, you might do the math and say, hey, there's more than six if it's 186 and 193. What's missing here is the EU uh, is considered by themselves to be a party. But for the countries involved, there are only six left out, and the US is one of them. Of course, it's the only developed country in the world that's not part of it. And in fact, it it produces the most waste 
per capita of any country in the world. So it's really stunning and, and sad that the U.S. is not party to the convention. In the beginning, the Basel Convention was designed for factory waste, as I call them. So stuff coming out of commercial operations, chemical waste, etc. Today, things have changed. Now the waste streams of concern that are hazardous waste that are traded are post-consumer. They're old stuff that we have used in commerce or in our personal lives. So it's old waste ships are a tremendous problem being dumped on the beaches of South Asia and managed there in very primitive conditions, harming the workers. Ban works on that. And there's e-waste coming out of our own houses and our own companies and and businesses is the other post-consumer waste that's uh, most trafficked in the world right now. So the first thing I want to talk about is the Basel Ban Amendment. And I'm going to start with the history of it, because like I say, the history of the amendment is really the history of the convention. So the way things started in this whole issue was in the late 1980s, we had an epidemic of waste trade events. There was a ship called the Cayenne Sea, which was loaded up with Philadelphia incinerator ashes. And they went down to Haiti and dumped them on the beach there at this beach. And then they were stopped halfway and they had to move across the world trying to find other places to dump the waste. It became a huge media um, scandal because the ship was just trafficking all the seas, looking for a country to dump the rest of its waste in. It became quite a, quite a story. That was, a, that was a famous one. Another one was Italian chemical companies dumped their barreled up chemical waste, some of the worst waste you can imagine, PCBs, et cetera, on a beach in Nigeria. And this is what it looked like when it arrived there and uh, people had to deal with it. Uh, another big story was the Islip garbage barge from New York, which went all the way down to the Caribbean looking for a place to dump the garbage. So these were high profile events and uh, Greenpeace at the time uh, chronicled these events and also did a lot of direct actions targeting this type of waste trade and documenting all of it in a, in a large inventory. So UNEP at the time, it was headed up by um, a gentleman named Mustafa Tolba, decided to create a treaty to protect Africa. Uh, he was Egyptian and to protect the world. He said, this is a transboundary issue. It calls for a treaty, an international treaty, under the auspices of the United Nations Environment Program. So the convention was negotiated, and that's when I came into the scene of some of the latter parts of the negotiations. And most of the countries went there to the convention wanting to ban this type of trade, at least from developed to developing countries. Sadly, uh, the convention was adopted without a ban, as is the case with a lot of international law. It's developed by consensus, so all it takes is one country to say, no, we don't want a ban, and you don't get a ban. Uh, so in 1989 in Basel, Switzerland, uh, I was there, and this banner was hung outside the convention hall, uh, signaling the fact that the ban was not part of the convention originally. Uh, the African group walked out saying, we're not going to sign it. We're going to go to Africa and create our own uh, regional agreement. And uh, Greenpeace denounced it, as you can see in the banner here. But to the credit of the developing countries that really wanted a ban from the outset, uh, they went back and did what the Africans said they were going to do in Africa and other areas started looking at regional bans. And in fact, regional agreements were adopted and negotiated. These are four that still exist and are in force today. The Central American Agreement for all the Central American countries, they said there's no imports of hazardous waste coming in. Bamako also, African continent is off limits to any waste trade. The Waigani Treaty in the South Pacific Forum parties did a similar thing to the Bamako Convention. And then in the Mediterranean region, as part of the Barcelona Convention, an Izmir protocol was developed to also put a ban in place. So large blocks of countries were all supporting the ban. So the time the, par the Basel Convention came into its first meetings, uh, they were primed to create a ban. And indeed, at the second conference of the parties, uh, a ban was floated. The original 
the original idea, the original decision was put forth by the group of 77, which is what the political group of developing countries was called at the time, and China joined in that ban. And then during the course of that meeting, the pressure from the developing countries uh, and the EU seeing that what was happening, that the developing countries really did want this ban, and we're going to put this proposal on the table, uh, during that meeting, they gained the support of the EU. So that was almost all the countries except for a group known as the Just Cans, which is Japan, US, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and South Korea. They opposed. So the first bit of opposition, the ban did pass because um, even though those countries in the Just Cans didn't want it, they were completely outnumbered. And they immediately said, this is not legally binding. It's just a decision. And the Just Cans made that case. And so the Minister of Environment of Denmark, who became a real champion, said, OK, we'll amend the convention. So at the next meeting, there was a decision to amend the convention. And that decision was known as Decision 3-1. And that happened in 1995. And since that time, many efforts by the Just Cans countries for, for the period from 1996 to 2010 was a period of different tactics to try to undo, weaken, or delay entry into force of the ban that was adopted in 1995. 2010, they finally laid to rest the last controversy, and it was just a matter then of collecting enough ratifications for it to go into force, which it did uh, last week. So this was off the uh, Basel Convention website, their announcement of showing the flags of the countries that support the ban amendment, that it did go into force last week. And we'll talk about what that means. So what does the Basel ban do and not do? Um, it creates a new Annex 7, and it's uh, developed countries, consisting of member states of the European Union, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, and Liechtenstein. So that's what Annex 7 looks like, and it's extremely important. So it's basically dividing the world in between Annex 7 and non-Annex 7, and it prohibits the export of hazardous waste from Annex 7 countries to the non-Annex 7 countries. Very simple. It does not prohibit trade from the non-Annex 7 countries to any other countries, so developing countries can trade in their waste and bring it to uh, a developed country, for example. And it does not prohibit trade between Annex 7 countries. So the OECD countries can trade in waste between themselves. Some facts about the ban. So after December 5th, what really took place is the convention is, has to be rewritten. It now has a new preambular paragraph. It has this new Annex, Annex 7. And it has a new article, Article 4A. And that article basically sets out that there's not going to be any exports from Annex 7 to non-Annex 7. Now, the US, being a non-party, they never ratified the convention. They never put it together to do that in all these years, even though the Senate gave advice and consent years ago to do so. It's never happened. So when the US gets around to it, when and if, the U.S. ratifies the convention, they will now have to accept the ban because it will be part and parcel of the convention as a new Article 4A. Currently, 98 out of the 187 Basel parties have ratified it, and the number is still growing. Just very recently, we had Costa Rica join this, this month in November. So we're hoping more and more countries will join. We hope the U.S. will ratify the convention and join at some point. Some more facts. Now, technically, it only applies to those countries that have ratified it. But all Basel parties in another part of the convention, as I mentioned, they have to respect other countries' prohibitions. And if they're part of the ban ratification, then all the parties have to respect that. Uh, in that in, for example, Canada, which has not ratified the ban amendment, if they wanted to export to Indonesia, which has ratified the ban amendment, they wouldn't be able to do that. It does not control the list of other wastes, Annex 2, normally. Now, some countries, 
like in the EU, they did include Annex 2 in their adoption of the ban. So they include Annex 2, but it's somewhat unique. And then looking at the entire list of Annex uh, 7 countries, there's 41 of them. And what's really interesting is that 35 of those 41 had already implemented it or ratified it. So here's the list. Take a look. The green are the ones that had previously implemented or ratified, and most of those are the European Union countries, uh, 28 of those. And then the Just Cans group that I mentioned are on the right column, and those ones at the top have implemented the convention, but not the ban. So they still have not ratified the ban amendment, and the U.S. has done neither. They have not ratified either the original convention or the ban amendment. Now, what the ban does, in effect, is what we call internalizing costs, which otherwise would have been externalized or have been externalized. So talking about that in economic terms, you're basically making other people pay the costs of your waste by moving it to developing countries where they have no ability to bill you for the damage. They have little ability to regulate the problem there. They don't have the infrastructure, et cetera. So waste was flowing down this gradient from the rich to the poor countries. The ban said, put a stop to that and said, no, we're going to internalize those costs and things will be more efficient, therefore. So you have the column on the left-hand side of the disposal costs and rich countries are higher. And this is what drove the waste tobogganing downhill to the developing countries. The effect of the ban is to turn that phenomenon around. The environmental impacts of doing that, of course, the obvious one is the downstream impacts. Um, it's going to protect the environment and people in developing countries from pollution and toxic exposures. That's very clear. What's not as well known and thought of is the upstream impacts. A ban like this provides new economic and legal incentives for implementing waste prevention and green design at the source. So we now have an economic incentive to prevent waste rather than just find new hiding places for it. And that's absolutely a more efficient way on the waste management hierarchy to deal with waste generally. So that's a huge impact. What it means for electronics recyclers, uh, some of these are subtle and some of them are obvious. E-waste is most often considered hazardous waste under the convention because it contains lead, mercury, et cetera, in, in quantities that create a hazardous characteristic. So it's generally considered that e-waste is covered by the Basel Convention, and therefore covered by the ban. Now, exporters in Bonnel, Basel Annex 7 countries that have ratified the ban, let's say, you know, Germany, they cannot export to non-Annex 7 countries. That's true now, and it was true earlier because the EU like I mentioned, had already ratified the ban amendment early and put it into their EU law. But what's a little more uh, nuanced is that, again, exporters in Basel Annex 7 countries that have not ratified the ban must still cease their e-waste export to non-Annex 7 Basel countries that have. So again, the example was Canada to Indonesia. And in the U.S., um, not much is going to change because the U.S. not being a party, they have always been uh, subject to the party to non-party ban. So exports of e-waste to non-Annex 7 countries continues in the U.S. to be illegal, unfortunately not for the exporters, but for the importers. So the trading partners of all these exports of electronic waste that we have documented for so long they're under great risk of facing criminal prosecution. So you're putting your trading partners at risk, but because the U.S. is not a party to the Basel Convention, as you've seen, there are very few environmental laws that are going to dictate no export. What seems to have more traction, as we've seen, is fraud. If you say you're not going to export and you do, then you can be prosecuted in the U.S., so what it means for e recycling certifications, we have now, at least what I'm aware of, four different certifications globally. There's R2, there's E-Stewards in the order in which they were developed. There was WeLabex in Europe, 
and that evolved into the Cinelec standard in Europe. So there's basically four, two of them more Eurocentric. And of these, East Stewards already incorporates the ban amendment. We Leave X recognizes the ban amendment and Cinelec does as well. R2 does not. So to summarize, Cinelec and We Leave X certifications always apply the ban amendment in the EU because it's part of EU law. East Steward supplies the ban amendment even in countries that are not party to the Basel Convention or the amendment anywhere it's supplied. And R2 places certifying companies that don't educate themselves well on this issue in legal peril because it does not recognize the Basel ban amendment. It does not recognize the Basel definitions of hazardous waste. And it doesn't recognize that companies and not facilities are legally accountable for Basel violations. So as you know, the R2 standard, you can get uh, certification just facility by facility, uh, even if one of the facilities of the company is violating the standard. So if you want a more information, we prepared with the IPIN group um, a guide. And this guide is available on the library of the BAN website. And the BAN website, of course, is at BAN.org. So you can get a guide there that goes into an FAQ of all these issues and explains things in even more depth. So I'm going to open it up for questions before I get into the next batch of amendments, which are the plastic amendments. So let's see if we have any questions to uh, get us going on the Basel BAN amendment. And you can raise your hand on the on your monitor there, and hopefully we'll see them. Who is it? Brooks talking. Brooks, can you hear me? Brooks Hoffman. I think I see your hand raised. He unraised his hand. Oh, he unraised it. Okay. Um, any other questions? It's clear as, as mud. <laughs> okay, we'll take questions at the very end as well. Yeah, Jim, I, I had a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Yeah, my question was why the United States, what justification has the United States given historically for not signing on? Very good question. Um, I get asked it <laughs> so many times. But part of it really is that the Basel Convention has been anathema to big blocks of industry. Um, the scrap industry, ISRI, has never embraced the Basel Convention. Uh, there are other blocks. At the time, uh, a few years ago, or 10 years ago, the Chamber of Commerce of the United States was opposed to the Basel Convention. So the very the convention itself was creating a lot of angst among those that really wanted an absolute free trade. And then when the ban amendment was, uh, became a decision that was passed, uh, they got even more objections from these industry blocks. So not all industries, of course, are, are opposed to it. We know that the CAER group, the Coalition of American Electronics Recyclers, is a long list of electronics recyclers in North America. Many of you are part of that group really want to see a ban to level the playing field with Europe, et cetera, and not be outcompeted with people that are doing it the cheap and dirty way. So the blocks of industry are not monolithic at all, but the U.S. was really listening for the longest time to these industry groups. And every time they wanted to move on it, it got blocked. And then time went on, and now Congress is pretty much dysfunctional. And we haven't joined an environmental treaty for a long time. Minamata Treaty on, on Mercury was a little bit of a, an exception, but we're not part of many environmental uh, treaties that have happened in recent years. So that's a, a long answer, but we just got left out. Uh, and then the impetus to do so and the functionality of Congress became you know, really dubious. And so we are where we are. Any other questions? All right, I'm going to move move onward. Um, 
to what happened in May at the Basel Convention meeting, Conference of Parties number 14. Um, the Plastics Amendments uh, were adopted. Many of you have heard a little bit about these. We're going to dive in a little more depth of what it's all about. First looking at why did it happen? Why did Basel suddenly decide to start controlling plastics? And the biggest reasons uh, I'm going to outline, uh, three of them. The National Sword. Uh, when China banned the scrap of all kinds, they included banning plastic imports and massive amounts of our plastic were going to China. But they put up a ban and unless the purity level is 99.5%, you no longer can send that plastic to China. That move created quite a, a chaos in the plastic waste uh, trade. Looking at this chart, you can see earlier that China in 2017 uh, was getting about 60% of the G7 plastic waste, and even more of that in from the US. And then in 2018, with the ban going into force, you see the streams have really changed. And China's getting less than 10% at that time, and now they're getting very, very small amounts, and it's totally illegal contraband. So that has created quite a phenomenon. Why did that happen? There was a very influential film called Plastic China, which really put a spotlight on what that plastic recycling really looked like in China. Uh, it was a devastating film. It was shown in China, then quickly banned in China. And then just weeks after it was banned, uh, the national sword policy came into play. But it's because it was so extremely polluting. The types of plastics that these countries, first China and now the movement, the exodus of all this material is going to Southeast Asia. It's mixed plastic. It's very difficult to sort it. A lot of it is not economical to recycle. So all of it was uh, subject to just dumping maybe as much as 50% of the incoming. And it was very difficult to sort out what they wanted. And so the rest of it was dumped. Uh, now that's happening in Southeast Asia. These are some pictures from Southeast Asia. And unfortunately, the, one of the biggest problems from an environmental standpoint is this stuff is burned. The stuff that they can't recycle economically just gets burned. And villages all over Southeast Asia now are subject to a new source of pollution, and they're getting really upset about it. So this has started to make headlines. And local environmental groups in Southeast Asia primarily are really up in arms, and therefore their politicians are getting up in arms. Some more pictures. This is one taken where they were burning the, the plastics to make tofu. And uh, the tofu factory was obviously getting the exposure from the burning of the plastics, which is going to have dioxins and heavy metals and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in it. The burning of plastics is a nightmare. It creates some of the most toxic compounds known. Uh, but this is what routinely happens. So that became known, and uh, that was a big impetus. The other thing was the issue of the marine pollution by plastics. Multiple discoveries and research is showing the degree of plastic pollution and the harm it causes. And it's become a global tour de force in the environmental movement akin to climate change. Many resources are being mobilized to try to prevent the marine pollution, mostly by plastics. Um, but I have to say, and the African groups pointed out at the Basel meeting, it's not just marine pollution. Plastics are a terrestrial pollutant as well, and they're everywhere. And again, because so often they get burned at the end of the day, it's really a toxic nightmare. So that was the other big issue. And then finally, uh, the Basel Convention to, was called upon because it exists. People are saying, well, we need to make a whole treaty on plastics. Well, that could take 10 years. That could take at least five years. But the Basel Convention was already there. It had the ability to, to step up and control some of the more egregious practices and to get the transparency needed to know what's going on with all this plastic waste globally. So at, in May at the Conference of Parties, the um, treaty was adopted by a proposal put forth by the Norwegian delegation. Here they are standing behind their flag uh, at the meeting. 
those guys, of course, were strong promoters, but they were very uh, smart on getting support. And the advocates of the ban included all the African countries, all the Asia Pacific countries, amazingly enough, and all the European Union. So there's about a, you know, there's 187 parties. We got a huge chunk of parties that were all supportive and including in Asia, stunningly, uh, Japan, which is one of the Just Cans group, which usually doesn't support these type of initiatives. They were part of the agreement. They were a co-sponsor and China also very surprisingly came out in the meeting with the strongest view of all, which didn't prevail, but they wanted to control all plastic waste with the PIC procedure, uh, all of them, no matter what. So that's not what happened, but it was interesting that China was pushing an even stronger view. And of course the NGOs, uh, there we are at the banned flag on the, at the meeting, uh, announcing a petition, which eventually had more than a million signatures supporting the Norwegian amendment. The opponents, um, most of the true opponents were observers. So the US was the observer country. They're not a party, they're considered an observer. And then a lot of industry groups uh, in both the plastic industry and of ISRI, the scrap industry. They were pushing really hard to have two countries represent their viewpoint. And those two countries happened to be Argentina and Brazil. Uh, most people, it was very transparent that they were really uh, moving initiatives more for these observers than they were for their own countries. The intention of the amendments is to ensure control and transparency for wastes which are not likely to be exported for non-mechanical recycling or are not likely to be recycled properly. So the non-mechanical is important. It's only um, going to allow waste movements that are going for mechanical recycling and not incineration, for example. And the waste they wanted to control, the ones that they were concerned about not being recycled properly, are waste mixtures. Because again, as I said, these mixtures are a disaster because they don't get properly sorted, uh, even in developing countries where you have very cheap labor. The exception to the no mixtures is that you can have mixtures of PET plastic, polyethylene, and polypropylene. Uh, those are going to be allowed. You can't have contamination. That has yet to be defined of how clean is clean. I don't think it's going to be the China standard, but it might be a very high standard. And you can't have halogenated polymers like PVC, with some exceptions. So then the control mechanism under Annex 2, which I mentioned, that this will all be controlled via the prior informed consent procedure. So if you're uh, one of those wastes up above there, a mixture or contaminated, you have to have the notification and get consent before you can trade in those wastes. So it requires the notification, the consent, and requires an assurance of environmentally sound management. Failure to do that, again, is illegal traffic under the convention and a criminal act. So that's the intent. And what really happened is, here's the before and after. Before, no country that I know of has ever controlled plastic waste. They had a listing under the non-hazardous um, annex, but nothing under the hazardous annex or under annex two. So nobody was really controlling it. Uh, there were no specific listings on the hazardous wastes I mentioned, only on non-hazardous and nothing on Annex 2. So the change is that now we have a listing as a hazardous waste. So if a plastic happens to uh, exhibit a hazardous characteristic and contain a hazardous constituent like lead, for example, then indeed it will be considered a hazardous plastic. The impact of that in the real world is small because there's very little plastics that are going to qualify there. And Annex 9 is going to be strengthened. The impact there is small to medium. The big change is that everything that's not on Annex 9, non-hazardous, or on the Annex 8, hazardous, is going to be controlled under Annex 2. So every bit of plastic is going to be subject to control if it's not non-hazardous.
So we need to look at what is non-hazardous. Um, these are the four types of plastics that are not going to be controlled. So these are the ones that are considered non-hazardous. Plastic waste, almost exclusively consisting of one non-halogenated polymer. So if you have sorted your plastic and it's all PET basically, or all ABS or all HIPS or whatever, then it's going to be exempt from the controls. But again, the sorting is not the normal practice right now. And then if you have another plastic waste that's sorted that consists of one cured resin or condensation product, like urea formaldehyde resins, et cetera, and it has been sorted, then you're also exempt. Third exemption is, is a halogenated waste, but it's the fluorinated polymers. They are exempted, although this is highly controversial and will probably be subject to more uh, negotiations as to whether these all should be exempt. Uh, because they do create a lot of toxic problems in the environment. But right now, if you can sort those and, and isolate them, they will be exempt. It's not a big issue for electronic plastics, those fluorinateds. And then mixtures of plastics waste that do consist of only polyethylene, polypropylene, or um, PET will be allowed, providing they are destined for separate recycling of each material in an environmentally sound manner and free from contamination. So those are the four plastic types not controlled. Anything other than those four controlled categories uh, will be controlled as hazardous, that's rare, as I mentioned, or Annex II. This is gonna be very common. This is what all the fuss is about. So most mixed and contaminated plastic waste will fall under Annex II. So what does this mean in the real world uh, with country blocks, et cetera, with respect to Annex 2, which we really need to focus on? If you are a Basel party and you're exporting to a Basel party, then you will have to use the pick procedure, but you can do it. It's no, there's no prohibition there. You just need to do the control procedure of pick, and that's because Annex 2 uses pick and does not use a ban procedure. Uh, if you're in the OECD, yes, you can use the OECD version of PIC, which is more streamlined. Now, there's one question that has been raised because the U.S. is not a happy um, puppy at the moment, and they are part of the OECD agreement. They're not part of the Basel agreement. So the U.S. has objected to the OECD adopting the Basel listings that just got passed this year. The, the U.S. has lodged an official complaint or uh, protest, and the OECD now is struggling with that to try to take that up, to try to reach a consensus. All of the other OECD countries are fine with the Basel listing, and normally the default is OECD will adopt all the Basel listings. But the U.S. has objected, so we're not sure of the result of that yet. Um, now, I mentioned that it's mostly the PIC procedure, right? Uh, so you can still trade. However, there are two special cases that have to be pointed out, the U.S. and the EU. The U.S. first. Um, again, they're debating on the OECD question as to whether they have to do PIC. That's under question at the moment. But normally, the U.S. not being a party, they can trade with other non-parties. But remember, there's only six of them. Uh, so that third row there, if the U.S. is trying to trade with the Basel party, which is most of the countries of the world that are not in the OECD, they're not allowed to do that legally from the importing country's point of view again. It would be criminal traffic, and you'll be subjecting your trading partners to criminal prosecution. And so that is a de facto ban that's in place for the USA because they're a non-party. The EU has a similar ban, but for a totally different reason. And that is because they have included Annex 2 in their ban implementation. So they consider anything on Annex 2 going to a non-Annex 7 country, a developing country, to be forbidden. So those are actual bans that a lot of people didn't realize happened when the Norwegian proposal was passed. I have a flowchart of all this. Um, Another document, the implications of the Norwegian amendments 
can be found on our website and you can pull that down from the library as well. So how does this affect the electronics gang? A lot of this we are not sure yet, but some things we can say. And these are the, the most common plastics that are in uh, computers and uh, IT equipment. Many different polymers there. There's about 12 that are common. Um, and most recyclers have not been separating these to the po single polymer level. Um, they have no capacity to do that. They've been relying on countries like Malaysia and China to do that. So this is a huge change that's all gonna kick into place, if I fail to mention, the implementation date is January 1, 2021. So you have one year to adjust your business to this new reality. Uh, as a result of the national sword, China is still off limits. They are not only forbidding the import, but they're enforcing it very strictly. There's no way you're going to get plastics into China unless it's 99.5% pure. Uh, but what's happened is many Chinese businesses have thus set up their operations in Southeast Asia. Most of these are highly polluting. Uh, and U.S. brokers are continuing to find outlets in those facilities as we speak. Um, that, I think, is going to change. There's increasingly pressure in these countries to turn back containers which are not clean, that are not pure polymers, that are mixed with a lot of garbage. Uh, it's due to the widespread pollution that's been publicized in these countries caused by these facilities. So even if there's a great facility in a country like Malaysia, it's going to be subject to a lot of scrutiny and perhaps a prohibition of import. That's something to really watch out for. For the U.S., again, a non-party, recyclers of all exports except for those exempt four categories will, will be requiring their trading partners to engage in illegal imports. Now, for East Steward certified companies, Annex 2 plastics will be considered hazardous e-waste and will be forbidden to export to non-OECD as of 2021. So we are going to do just what the EU did, and we're going to consider these part of the, the ban to non-OECD Annex 7, non-Annex 7 countries, sorry. For other U.S. e-cyclers, they will have a choice, either contribute to criminal trafficking and waste or find OECD or domestic desti destinations as e-stewards will do. And as a result of the Basel amendments, um, despite the U.S. protest, it remains very likely that intra-OECD trade is going to require some kind of control. Normally, one would still need to notify and get consent, uh, although pre-approved facilities are allowed in the OECD regime, so you can get a, a consent for the whole year. You don't have to notify each and every time. So that's a streamlining effect. But I do believe I'm closely following the negotiations in Paris that uh, the U.S. Um, protest, and I do believe that most of the countries are going to require controls. Uh, may not be as strict as, as would be normal, but there's going to be controls within OECD to OECD trade. And we can expect um, more markets in Asia to dry up due to the pollution there and the political pressures. Uh, some of them may adopt the Chinese standard, those levels. And it's impossible to predict the rise and fall of prices of scrap. It depends on so many things. It depends on the price of oil, which impacts the virgin plastic price big time. Uh, it depends on the demand in China for the really pure product, like the pellets that are created at that 99.5% purity, or of the demand of OEMs for post-consumer content, companies like Dell, which are requiring their computers to be made with recycled plastics from computers. Uh, I don't usually give a business advice, but uh, Prudence would, would call for assuming that your plastics are going to be a net loss, and you're not going to profit from them, and to charge customers accordingly. Larger companies that invest in domestic separation or recycling in the U.S. or in OECD countries like Mexico could be ahead in the long term. It still might be seen as a bit risky to make such an investment, but I think the 
the handwriting on the wall is that there's going to be less and less trade, particularly to non-OECD countries, allowed. Many plastics in the near to midterm will be exported, unfortunately. We can foresee that to substandard operations illegally or be incinerated or landfilled. Um, BAN is gearing up to try to be able to track plastic waste as we track electronic waste with GPS trackers. It's very important to know where the illegal shipments are going. And increasingly, I believe from a policy and design perspective, plastics will be seen as poorly suited to a truly circular economy. They just are not circular. They cannot be readily recycled. And when they are recycled, it's almost always downcycling. And if you go to chemical recycling or incineration, you're going to be exacerbating the climate issue big time. So looking at it very closely, it looks like there's going to be increasing calls for banning different types of plastic and moving away from using plastic wherever possible. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up and take questions on all of the above. And um, we'll open up here to you can raise your hand and uh, ask one of those pressing questions that's on your mind. We have Dennis Betts. Dennis, shoot it to me. Dennis Betts. You have, maybe you have to unmute. Dennis, can't hear you, but I see your hand is up. Well, maybe you just wanted to make a comment. Uh, if your audio is not working, you can also ask a question through the chat or through the uh, question and uh, portion. Yeah, if you want to put your question in writing, you can do that. We'll see it. Anybody else have a question about any of these new bans that are in place. Again, the plastic one goes into force on January 1st, 2021. Uh, the Basel ban amendment is in force as of this month. Be sure to take advantage of the resources um, I mentioned in our library on both of these um, issues, both of these new prohibitions and controls, and uh, they go into more depth, and you can get a lot of your questions answered that way. So if I don't see any questions... Um, so for Dennis Betts, uh, these slides will be available offline after the session, so you'll be able to download this uh, through an email that you'll get from go to webinar slash go to meeting. Yeah, so all of our webinars we're going to be putting up um, without password protection. So you can just grab them, whoever you are in the industry uh, can get a hold of these webinars. We've done, this is our second one. We plan to do one every quarter. If any of you are interested in a webinar topic or want to help give a webinar in our East Steward series, drop us a line. We're very uh, interested. So I think that's a wrap. I really appreciate you joining us uh, this morning, this afternoon, and I uh, hope you join us for the next one. Take care. Happy holidays.